to you in the name of Jesus. It's good to be here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Before I say anything else, I just want to get this out. I want to say how thankful I am to this congregation, to all of you for being able to be allowed to be able to take a sabbatical. I thank you for the freedom to be able to step away and to read and actually have time to think about what I read, uh, time to travel and time to observe and, and learn from others, and finally time to reflect on all of that. So I do really, truly thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Now over the course of my sabbatical, I managed to worship in five other states with Lutherans. I, I learned from them. I interviewed their pastors. I interviewed their worship leaders. I asked lots of questions. I gathered lots and lots of information. And one of the, one of the pastors I was interviewing, he, he said to me, he said, you know, I feel sorry for you. I go, why is that? He goes, well, I was on sabbatical, and I got to go to Tanzania with my whole family. Here you are in northern Illinois all by yourself. <laughs> Well, that was true, that part. <laughs> but you know what? I was really glad I went there to McChesney Park, Illinois, because I learned a tremendous amount from this congregation in this particular aspect as well. Now, the weeks that I wasn't traveling, I wasn't traveling all the time, the weeks that I wasn't traveling, I had a chance to worship with some other local Lutheran congregations, and that was great too. I wasn't on the clock there. I wasn't taking notes and all that. But I... You know, when you have those experiences where you're out with the, the neighboring congregations, you get a chance to see what other communities of faith are like, uh, what their worship is like. You, what's the mood? I, can I sense the mood of the congregation? Can I, can I get a little drift of what their hopes and their dreams are? And it was all very valuable. And then over this past week or so, I've had final wrap-up time, and I've been, been trying to make sense of everything that I have seen and experienced. I've been trying to draw some conclusions and, and make some recommendations. And I hope uh, very soon to be sharing those with the leaders of our congregation and with anybody else who's interested. So if you're interested in seeing my, my final report on the sabbatical, it's a little too long to publish in connection, so, but I'd be happy to share it with anybody who wants to take a look at it. Just let me know. Send me an email if you're interested in that. But right now, what I want to say is, it's good to be here at Princeton's. It's good to be here with you. Us together. You know, as I travel around, I, I may have seen a few congregations that maybe in one aspect or another might have had a little better practice than we do. You know, I was, I was mostly studying contemporary worship and various settings around the country. I was concentrating on that, but you can't help but notice everything else as well. And these were all really good congregations. They were recommended to me by pastors all across the nation. It wasn't just, here's three people I know, call them up and ask them. Uh, what I did is I put this out on social networking media for ELCA clergy, and there's a potential of 8,000 different ELCA pastors saw my proposal. A whole bunch of them responded to me. And so what I was looking for, I narrowed the list down. I got down to the best mid-sized congregations in the entire nation for doing contemporary worship. So these, were, these were good congregations. But having said that, I have to say this. I may, I may have picked up a better practice here and there, but after seeing the supposed best all across the nation, I, I will tell you that Princeton really awesome congregation. Yeah. <laughs> Yourselves a hint. And there are many things that all of these best congregations could learn from us. But anyway, it's good to be back. I missed you. It's good to be home. Learning doesn't stop there. I, I hope you had a chance to learn too while I was away. That as you worshiped and as you experienced learned a thing or two along the way and we as a congregation we can grow together and we can adapt and we can be even better at living out that purpose that God has given us even better than we already are fact is no person no organization 
and especially no congregation can ever stay entirely the same. Now, it may be comfortable to say we want to stay the same, but it doesn't work. At least not if you want to live. Certainly not if you want to grow. Not if we want to follow the living God wherever the living God might call us and lead us. Nothing changing in the congregation means one thing. It means death. That's the only way you're not going to change. Because the world and the community, we are constantly moving on. And Jesus has a thing or two to say about death. He's against it. There's an old joke. I've probably told you this one before. If I have, apologies. Please indulge me because it really fits here. It's just three people talking about what they would like said when the time of their own funeral comes. And the first, first guy says, you know what I want to hear at my funeral is I want people to say he was a wonderful, dedicated, skillful surgeon that through his work he saved the lives and improved the lives of thousands of people. The second person says, you know what I, I'd like to hear said at my funeral? I'd like to hear that, that I, this was a woman of great passion and was an advocate for the poor, that she gave of herself generously and tirelessly for the sake of others. I said, well, those are pretty good. But you know what I want to hear at my funeral? Look, he's moving. That's what happened when Jesus showed up at this funeral procession in May. I want you to kind of picture the scene. You can go to the next slide, Dean. I didn't tell Dean, didn't warn him we were going to have pictures. <laughs> Picture the scene. The service is done. The mourners are making that solemn, sad journey to place of burial. Paul Barriers are carrying a young man who died out of season, way too young left a widowed mother who had no other sons. And in that society, her own survival's in jeopardy as well. And along comes Jesus. The first, first thing he says is to the woman, he says, don't cry. Jesus just flunked every pastoral care course that was ever created. Right, Pastor Amber? It's <laughs> the one thing he never say to anybody. He would have been drummed out of seminary. But Jesus has got something far better than this empathetic pastoral care presence that we are all taught. Our reading says he touched the coffin, but it's probably not correct because they didn't use coffins in the first century as well. Probably more like a body wrapped in a burial shroud being carried on a litter. Probably something like what you see there. He went over it and he touched the body. I didn't touch. And this is important because that was not allowed in Jewish law. You were not allowed to touch your body the day you were clean. Nothing you did afterwards would do any good until you had gone through all kinds of elaborate cleaning rituals. Touch the body. And then he said, young man, get up. And he did. He got up. Talk about What's new? What's new? How about life? How about hope? How about possibilities? How about second chances? Here's something I want you to think about. I'm going to take a few minutes of thinking about this. If your life was miraculously saved today, what would be different for you tomorrow? Or if you prefer to think from the mom's point of view, if you saw your whole world ripped away from you today and then miraculously restored. What would be different for you tomorrow? So what would change? What would you do? Anybody. What would you do if you had a second chance at life? Celebrate. What else? I heard it over here somewhere. Thank God. Thank you, Elsie. Yeah, what else? Dancing. Hallelujah. <laughs> We'd all be dancing. Everybody in that funeral procession would be dancing and praising God, right? You know, I, I was thinking about this. And, well, what would I do different? Well, maybe I'd hold my family and loved ones a little bit closer. Maybe I'd spend a little more time with them. Well, we might all make some different choices. We don't know why the young man died. Maybe he made a bad choice. And now here's a chance to not make that kind of choice again. We don't know. 
in my imagination, though, I kind of, when he sits up, I kind of picture him, him and mom looking at each other and saying to each other, you know, it is good to be here with you, and it's good to be here with Jesus. Now, they weren't the only ones there. There was a large crowd that followed Jesus. There were all the people from the village. And they had reactions, too. The first reaction they had was fear. They filled fear. Now, that fear might be the sense of awe and reverence, but I think it's also really fear, afraid fear. In the Bible, when you come close to God, that's usually the reaction. Angels, God, are always saying, fear not, first thing they said. I think when they saw what had just transpired before them, they knew they were in the very presence of God, and so naturally they were filled, filled with fear. But they didn't stop there. They didn't get stuck on fear. Because the next thing they were filled with was praise. They gave words to what they experienced. Luke recorded a couple of them. Like a great prophet has appeared among us. This God has come to save his people. They didn't stop there. They went and they told others. The news spread throughout the country and the surrounding territories. What do you have? Awe, praise, witness, living and sharing the news. About it. it sounds like the mission of the church, doesn't it? Oh, that phrase, witness. Living the good news, sharing the good news. Now sometimes, when I hear a story like this, my initial thought is, I wish I could have been there. Wouldn't it have been cool to see that experience? Have you ever feel that way? Well, I want you to know this. You have. Now, I haven't seen anybody sit up out of a casket yet. Probably you haven't either. But think about this. Every time we encounter Jesus, there's a miracle of new life. Every time we realize Jesus loves us, that's a miracle of new life. Every time we realize our sins are forgiven, that's a miracle of new life. Every time we look at somebody else and we see Jesus in them, that's a miracle of new life. Every time someone looks at us and sees Jesus in us, it's a miracle of life. Even at funerals. We heard these words yesterday at Margaret's uh, memorial service. We hear that promise of eternal life, and we believe and we know that, that one day we too will gather with our loved ones before the, before the throne of the Lamb. And we know that we realize the miracle of new life that we're going to be there that party has no end where maybe just maybe we'll look at each other and say to one another you know what it's good to be here with you and it's good to be here with Jesus what's new life with one another life with Jesus every day in every way Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.